Good morning, good afternoon, colleagues and friends. Welcome to CITC online training of developing climate change adaptation projects to access climate finance and en enabling environment for national level adaptation efforts. I'm very pleased to be the lecturer of the first lecture, which is entitled Landscape of Global Climate Finance and Access to Climate Change Adaptation Finance. My name is Ariel. I'm the deputy director of IG, IGES Regional Center. Meanwhile, I'm also the program manager of UNFCCC Regional Collaborating Center for Asia and the Pacific. My presentation will cover three topics. The first is global climate finance landscape. The second is climate finance mobilization in ASEAN countries and third is accessing international climate funds. So let's start with the first topic, global climate finance landscape. In terms of climate finance flows, it's reached a record high of US dollar 612 billion in 2017. Although there was a slight decrease in 2018, the 2017 and 2018 annual average still amounted to US dollar 579 billion, which was a more than 25% increase compared to 2016. In terms of sources of climate finance, private finance accounted for the majority. The figure in the left shows that the private finance accounted for 56% of total global climate finance, while public finance accounted for 44% of um, the global total. Concerning public finance, national develop, development financial institutions were the largest providers of public finance. Spending on transport outpaced the renewable energy and became the largest beneficiary of public finance receiving US dollar 94 billion or 37% of the public total. In terms of private finance, corporations continue to account for the majority of private investment, but commercial financial institutions play a more important role than ever. Out of the quantity, 85% of private finance flow to renewable energy, 14% of private finance went to low carbon transport and under 1% to all other sectors, reflecting a preference for more commercially viable sustainable projects and industries among private investors. In terms of financial instruments that was used the most to channel climate finance, averaging US dollar 380 billion or two thirds of the global climate finance annually. More specifically, grants amounted to US dollar 29 billion, accounting for 5% of the global total. That, as I mentioned, amounted to 380 billion, accounting for two thirds of the global total. Specifically, there were three types of debt. For example, project finance amounted to US dollar 223 billion, balance sheet borrowing amounted to US dollar 93 billion and low cost project debt amounted to US dollar 64 billion. Equity was another popular instrument which amounted to US dollar 169 billion accounting for 29% of the global total. In terms of semantic allocation of climate finance, mitigation finance still accounted for the majority of total flows. More specifically, mitigation finance accounted for 93% of total flows in 2017-2018, or US dollar 537 billion annually on average. Um, I would like to highlight um, three sectors. The first was the uh, transportation sector. Financing for low carbon transport is increasing very rapidly, rising by 54% from its 2017 
2015-26 level to US dollar 141 billion in 2017-2018. This was primarily led by increased investment in rail and transit projects by corporates and public actors and increased purchase of uh, EVs by householders. EV charging infrastructure also accounted for another additional um, 3, 3 billion US dollar per year in the sector compared to the 2015-2016 level. Um, additionally, renewable energy still remains as uh, the main destination for global climate finance representing US dollar 337 billion annually or 58% of global finance. Lastly, I would like to highlight adaptation finance, which rose, rose significantly from its previous level in 2015-2016 with an annual adaptation finance reaching US dollar 30 billion on average in 2017-2018 while water projects remain the largest share of adaptation finance, spending on other sectors, including land use and disaster risk re reduction also increased. Lastly, in terms of geographic distribution of climate finance, East Asia and the Pacific region remain the largest regional provider of and destination for climate finance. Looking at the sources of climate finance, most climate finance or 76% of the track total is still invested in the same country in which it is sourced. In terms of destination, finance pro for projects in non-OECD countries reached US dollar 356 billion accounting for 61% of global climate finance. Next, let's zoom in and have a close look at climate finance mobilization in ASEAN countries. Let's first focus on international climate finance. From OECD DAC database, we can see that development finance projects where climate solutions are the main principal objective average approximately US dollar 3.2 billion annually between 2013 and 2017. In terms of sources of international climate finance, bilateral sources accounted for almost half of the total international finance flow to the ASEAN countries. Additionally, multilateral development banks accounted for 46% of the total and climate funds accounted for 6%. In terms of destination, Vietnam, the Philippines and Indonesia have received 82% of climate-related development finance in the period of 2013 to 2017. In terms of a semantic allocation of climate finance, 2016 and 2017 saw a more balanced allocation between mitigation and adaptation with 47% and 41% of the total allocated to adaptation projects respectively. However, um, in the previous years, allocation to adaptation projects only accounted for 15 to 32%. In terms of instruments, bilateral flows favor concessional debt with more grants allocated to adaptation projects proportionally. This data is in line with global trends, where adaptation projects broadly struggle to attract private capital at scale due to their high public good elements. MDBs focus financing on non-concessional debt particular in mitigation projects such as renewable energy projects where revenue streams can be stable and predictable. Climate funds are a significant source of grant funding and concessional debt. In terms of sector distribution, energy and transport projects capture the most flows in climate mitigation with disaster risk reduction and water and sanitation projects, the most significant adaptation sectors. 
agriculture, forestry, and land use are full features, a significant balance between both mitigation and adaptation projects. Within energy projects, an equal amount, 36%, was allocated to expansion of electricity grids and energy networks and to renewable energy projects with geothermal factoring significantly. Another 23% is estimated to go towards capacity building activities such as policy support and training. In transport, rail infrastructure and transit systems receive 68% of flows and the roads 17%, particular for adaptation purposes. A further 13% of flows was directed to capacity building activities. Flood prevention infrastructure accounted for 52% of disaster risk reduction flows, with the remaining 48% targeting capacity building. Similarly, 46% of finance in water and sanitation sector was for infrastructure projects, 22% for water conservation, 12% for capacity building, and the remainder for river basins development and waste management. These observations are well aligned with climate finance needs, where priority sectors for mitigation are energy, transport, forestry, and land use, while for adaptation, they are water supply and sanitation, public health, biodiversity, forestry, and watershed management. Domestic public finance can be a major source of finance to support climate actions. Such expenditure may occur at the national or subnational level or through national climate funds and public-private partnerships. Also, climate finance tracking of government expenditures at the domestic level is not widespread. Three ASEAN member states, Indonesia, the Philippines, and Cambodia, have implemented the UNDP methodology for climate public expenditure and institutional review, CPEIR. Given significant differences in government budgets within the three countries, flows range from $188 million in Cambodia to $6 billion in Indonesia. But in terms of percentage of GDP, the range is from 3% to 6%. Furthermore, how adaptation and mitigation actions are defined vary from country to country based on local circumstances and priorities. Both Indonesia and the Philippines implement automated budget tagging methodologies to regularly update and track their climate expenditure. Indonesia solely tracks mitigation finance, while the Philippines expenditure is predominantly on adaptation finance. Cambodia does not differentiate between the themes. Climate finance flows from international public sources are often side by side with private finance flows, either cross-border flows or domestically originated. Project developers and corporations, commercial banks and institutional investors provide debt or equity finance to climate projects or companies. Domestically, household investors and consumers also contribute finance flows through their retail purchases or saving investments. With the exception of a few countries, market capitalization is relatively limited in the region. The liquidity in the ASEAN equity markets also tends to be low. Equity markets in ASEAN tend to be highly volatile. Data related to private finance flows to climate action is limited both globally and in the region to specific sectors and instruments. Renewable energy project finance from both public and private sources average $5 billion in a year in ASEAN. While precise disclosed data on lending and equity flows to renewable energy projects is unavailable, the most prominent lenders participating in project finance deals are banks in the region along with ADB. This includes four Thai banks, Kasekong Bank, Bangkok Bank, Krun Thai Bank, and Siam Commercial Bank. Lastly, let's have a look at how ASEAN member countries 
access international climate funds. Overall, the operational entities and the UNFCCC have approved $222 million in commitments to projects in ASEAN since 2010. I will explain individually this climate fund in the next slides. Let's start with the Green Climate Fund, GCF. A total of eight projects have been approved in ASEAN committing $300. $25 million. The, um, of the approved funds, $292 million is pending disbursement. A further eight projects have been submitted to the GCF Secretariat. Brunei, Malaysia, and Singapore have not yet submitted funding proposals. The GCF Readiness Program was created to enhance country ownership and help countries access GCF resources. The program therefore provides resources for strengthening the institutional capacities of NDAs or focal points and DAEs to effectively engage with GCF. It also assists countries in undertaking adaptation planning and the development of strategic frameworks to build their programming with GCF. As of January 2020, a total of 31 readiness proposals were approved in ASEAN, mostly via international partners and only three via country um, governments directly, which are Cambodia, Indonesia, and Malaysia. Brunei and Singapore have not yet made use of GCF readiness program. 26 of the 31 um, proposals are for DNA strengthening, including country programming and strategy framework activities. Countries in the region have requested a total of $25.56 million in readiness funding, with Myanmar, Indonesia, and Thailand requesting the highest total amount, a total of $14.78 million has been approved, of which $3.9 million has been disbursed to date. Next, let's move on to Adaptation Fund. Four projects have been approved in the region, with the total amount of funding approved close to $24 million. Projects have been implemented mainly by UN agencies in Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, and Myanmar. In terms of the project pipeline of the Adaptation Fund, Indonesia is most active in submitting concepts and proposals to the Adaptation Fund, with nine sub submissions within the period of one year, last year 2019 to 2020, via the Partnership for Governance Reform. Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam have also submitted concepts and proposals via UN agencies. In total, 14 projects for the region are currently in the Adaptation Fund's pipeline, requesting a total of $45 million. The sectors of folks are urban development, water management, coastal management, aqua-based adaptation, disaster risk reduction, agriculture, and multi-sector. The Adaptation Fund Board has made available several small grants under the readiness program to help national implementing entities provide peer support to countries seeking accreditation with the fund and to build capacity for undertaking various climate finance readiness activities. This includes South-South Cooperation Grants, Project Formulation Assistance Grants, Technical Assistance Grants, Project Scale Up Grants. To date, no readiness grants have been approved for the ASEAN region. The only accredited national implementing agency in the ASEAN region is the Partnership for Governance Reform in Indonesia. Next, let's look at Global Environment Fund, JEF. JEF funds are allocated to projects addressing biodiversity, climate change, land degradation, international waters, chemicals, and waste. In the total, the ASEAN region has received $611 million in JEF grants and $6 billion in co-financing for climate change projects. In addition, the ASEAN countries were co-beneficiaries in projects 
that went beyond the ASEAN region amounting to $958 million in GEF grants and $8 billion in co-financing. Um, the left side table shows the total financing approved for individual ASEAN countries. The Philippines have received the most total funding via GEF co-financed projects, followed by Vietnam and Indonesia. Additionally, four regional projects limited to the ASEAN region have been approved. Next, let's have a look at the Least Developed Country Fund, LDCF. The Least Developed Country Fund established under UNCCC addresses the special needs of the least developed countries that are especially vulnerable to the adverse impacts of climate change. The LDCF reduces the vulnerability of sectors and resources that are central to development and livelihoods such as water, agriculture, and food security, health, disaster risk management and prevention, infrastructure, and fragile ecosystems. All LDCs are defined by uh, United Nations that are also party to the UN Climate Change Convention are eligible to access the LDCF. The list of LDC is reviewed every three years by the UN Economic and Social Council. The fund is tasked with financing the preparation and implementation of National Adaptation Programs of Action, NAPAS. NAPAS use existing information to identify a country's priorities for adaptation actions. The LDCF is the only existing fund whose mandate is to finance the preparation and implementation of NAPAS. Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar have received funding via LDCF. Next, let's have a look at Special Climate Change Fund, SCCF. The Special Climate Change Fund, SCCF, was established in response to guidance from COP7 in Marrakech in 2001. Any non-Annex 1 country who is party to UNCCC is eligible for project funding under SCCF. SCCF was established with four different uh, funding windows. Uh, window A is adaptation, window B is um, transfer of technologies, window C is mitigation, which include energy, transport, industry, agriculture, forestry, and waste management. Window D is economic diversification of for fossil fuel dependent countries. Currently, only window A adaptation and window B um, transfer of technology are active. Lastly, let me introduce a new initiative um, created for the Paris Agreement, which is called Capacity Building Initiative for Transparency or CBIT in short. The CBIT was created at the request of parties to help strengthen the institutional and technical capacities of non-Annex 1 countries to meet the enhanced transparency requirements defined in Article 13 of the Paris Agreement. Cambodia and now have received funding via the CBIT. My lecture ends here. I hope it is helpful and help set the scene for the other upcoming lectures. If you have any questions, feel free to drop me an email at yu at igs.or.jp.